Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and on today's episode of Projections, I'm going to be reviewing Half-Life Alex. Yes, the time has finally come. Uh, I've spent the last week or so playing the game. I've gone through the campaign now almost twice, and I'm going to be talking about it today in terms of how it fares as the latest entry in the Half-Life franchise, as well as Valve's first full-length AAA VR game, VR FPS. Now, I'm gonna start off by laying some ground rules down. I'll be showing footage and you'll be able to see part of the game, but I won't be talking about any story spoilers in here. And I'll try to cut the footage in a way it's gonna come in from out of order in different parts of the game. So even if you watch this review, hopefully it won't spoil the game for you and I'm not gonna play any of the game dialogue either. And if you do want to see more of the game, I have a separate video out right now that you can watch where I play through the first almost hour or so of Half-Life Alex, um, do it at a very slow pace to show you the mechanics of the hand interactions, the things that you can explore in the world, how the weapons work, and the link to that video is below. Uh, and you can, I think you can watch that without spoiling a big part of the game for you, and it'll give you a sense of how, for example, movement works uh, in Half-Life Alex. It has been, of course, 13 years since we last saw a Half-Life game from Valve, and I'm really pleased to confirm that Half-Life Alex, well, it feels like Half-Life, and it plays like it too. It has all the hallmarks of a Half-Life game. This wonderful blend of world exploration, of intense uh, combat, and kind of brain-scratching uh, puzzle-solving, in a cohesive narrative that in this case is set five years before the events of Half-Life 2, where you are of course playing as Alex Vance in City 17, uh, after the Combine has taken over the city and the world and is in the process of building the Citadel. So that's how I'll kind of frame this review. I'll be talking about what VR brings to Half-Life and what Half-Life brings to VR in terms of exploration, combat, and puzzle solving. So first, let's talk about exploring City 17 and the world of Half-Life Alex. We've been in City 17 before. We were in there in Half-Life 2, and it's a funny thing. When I'm in the game wearing the headset, this is almost like a City 17 that I remember being in. But if you compare the screenshots, of course, it's gonna be way more detailed. And it is so much different from experiential standpoint because you're wearing a VR headset. No longer are you looking around by moving a thumbstick or moving your mouse around, you're looking around by moving your head around. And that means that there's a real sense of scale, one-to-one -one real world scale, we call it presence in VR, that VR brings to the world of Half-Life. When I'm walking across rooftops, when I'm going through sewer tunnels or going through a train station, I'm, I'm peering around every corner. I'm actually leaning around corners, leaning over the edge of buildings and looking down, looking up, there's a real sense of awe and wonder when you're in this kind of familiar place of City 17, but it's different because it feels like you're there. And it also feels like a real place. This nameless Eastern European country you're in feels lived in. And that's credit to the Valve's art team uh, for being able to populate the world with so many high detail assets from the art on the walls to the architecture, both exterior and interior. You're able to get really up close to things now that you're in headset and every room that you're in, you want to explore, which changes kind of the pace of exploration. Unlike from from a, a traditional game where you might go, let's say you're in an apartment building and going from one room down a hallway to another room, it's not just a matter of rushing from point A to point B, now you are actually encouraged to explore and you benefit from opening every single cabinet, pulling open every drawer, looking under and behind every closet, opening doors because you're looking for ammunition, you're looking for this resin that you use to upgrade your weapons and you're looking for things to help fill out the story. Every nook and cranny 
begs to be explored and is really just dripping with atmosphere. Uh, so you're really traversing the world at a different pace than you would a traditional uh, single player first person shooter. It's not an open world game. It really is like a traditional Half-Life game. You're being funneled from point A to point B through the level to get from one place to another on your mission, but you're taking more time in every room. And these rooms, these buildings, you know, they're a mix of wide open arenas for combat as well as uh, dark corridors that make you feel really claustrophobic. And the aesthetics of the world building, this familiar Eastern European architecture of City 17 overlaid with the infestation of the aliens from Zen, as well as the mechanical constructs that the Combine have fused into the world. All of that makes this a wonderful and pretty terrifying world to explore. It's reminiscent not only of Half-Life, but of also post-apocalyptic worlds like The Last of Us, or influences from things like Stranger Things. And while the game isn't explicitly a horror game, there are definitely these tense moments with a dynamic light going from one room to the next. Every time you hold a door and peer inside it, peer into a room, even if it's just a bathroom, or or a kitchen or a hotel lobby, you're filled with dread because in the VR headset, you can't close your eyes and look away. You are there in the space. Now, getting around the world of Half-Life Alex means you have to traverse through it, and in VR, that offers some interesting opportunities. I'm sure you've heard by now there are a bunch of different movement options in the game. Uh, there's a teleport or blinking system where you basically uh, use a thumbstick on your controller and point to where you want to beam yourself or kind of warp yourself. Uh, but there's also continuous movement as well, and the continuous movement mode is what I played the game with. That's not to Say there are some moments where you do have to teleport, whether you're going off a ledge or teleporting onto a surface or mantling a surface. Uh, and I found myself staying in continuous movement uh, for most of it because that's where the combat felt the most engaging. If I'm going from one pillar to another barricade, um, it, it just in my head made more sense for me to use that continuous locomotion so I wouldn't get disoriented once I beam to a place and then had to figure out where the enemies were relative to me. But even with continuous movement, it's, Al Valve implemented a way for you to teleport uh, alongside it. So on your right thumbstick, you can actually pull the thumbstick back and then you still activate a teleport. And I found myself teleporting a little more than I thought I would, just because it's a little more faster to teleport. If I'm going across a wide stretch of an open space and I just need to get to that point as quickly as possible, I did find myself teleporting. But in those heated combat engagements, I was using continuous motion just to be a little bit more measured in the way I traverse from cover to cover. There's also the gravity gloves, which is one of the big innovations of Half-Life Alex. These in the game, they're called the Russells. And what they do is they allow you not only to have this HUD that's on your hands, you could look at the gloves and see your health status as indicated by three hearts, as well as your ammunition count or your resin count, uh, but you also can use it to grab things at a distance uh, in the world and grab them and pull them to you. And Valve put a lot of work in making these gravity gloves feel satisfying. And they're so much fun. You basically point your hand at an object, any of the physics objects in the room you're in, it highlights, you pull the trigger, then you basically sling it over to you almost as if you had it on a fishing line and then snatch it out of the air. And that grabbing it out of the air movement is what's satisfying. Whether you're pulling magazines from a shelf or you're pulling a, a gas canister to you or even a chair that you need to deflect a head crab that's coming at you, all of that just feels natural and even like an hour into the game, you're, after you have the gravity gloves, you're sling objects, you're juggling with them, and you're using them as if they're an extension of your arm. 
The gravity gloves are also one of the reasons that I think the game is best played with the Valve Index controllers. I played across a bunch of different headsets and different controllers because the Valve Index controllers, uh, interesting, almost feel like you have the hardware of the gravity gloves strapped onto your hand. And the way they're tied to your hand, you can release your hand and have these cap sense sensors so you have individual finger control. But when I'm looking at the, the mechanics of all this cobbled together kit bash hardware, um, the visuals of the gravity glove, and I have the index controllers on my hand, it's like, okay, I feel like I'm actually wearing the Russell hardware when I'm holding these controllers. Now combat is the second pillar of Half-Life gameplay I want to talk about. And this is a case where Valve has done a lot of the familiar things that other VR developers have done, uh, but also added their own flair. So anyone who's used VR knows that when you're holding a track controller in your hand, you have something like a pistol or a shotgun, uh, you actually have to aim down the sights. And that makes shooting, uh, I'm not gonna say more difficult, but definitely more satisfying. It's that one-to-one -one control of actually aligning your vision down the barrel, and then not only using that for precise aim on a zombie coming at you, or a head crab, or a combine soldier, but then also having to reload. And that two-hander interaction of reloading and hearing that you're out of ammo on your pistol and you have to press a button to drop the magazine, pull another magazine over your shoulder, clip it back in, and pull it and rack the first bolt into the chamber, uh, that is super satisfying as well. You build this kind of muscle memory that you have as you're going through the game, this extra movement that you have to do, not just pressing R to reload or dipping your gun down to reload, but having that extra layer of complexity means that it's adding a little bit of cognitive load, right? And that cognitive load makes these engagements with enemies where it might be just two zombies coming at you, but they're gonna take more than those 10 bullets to kill. You have to remember that you have to, can't let them get so close, you have to reload, and so many times in the game, I ran out of bullets and freaked out, and that freaking out allowed me to be vulnerable. I didn't feel bad about it, I just felt like, okay, this is where the fun in the game is. Feeling terrified in this apocalypse where I'm running out of ammo, conserving ammo, and having to run away and choose my shots very, very carefully. That amount of cognitive load, that mindfulness that you have to be during combat with not only aiming, but ammo management and reloading uh, is really accentuated in these heated battles with the combine soldiers as well. And you're never fighting against a ton of soldiers. Never, It's never gonna be a dozen soldiers coming at you, uh, but it's gonna be a good mix. You're gonna have some a few grunts and a few heavies with machine guns, some with shields, and they're gonna send at you some drones that get real close. And all of that means that even when you're you know, fighting against three or four enemies at once, you have to pick your shots judiciously. And the combat is intense. I'm physically ducking down, hiding behind barriers, I'm trying to sneak around, get behind cars, peeking through windows to see where they're moving. It's not just about a 30 second fight with a group of soldiers. These fights, if you're, especially if you're low on ammo and you need to conserve and be judicious about where you fire, look at that explosive weak point on that combine soldier's back. They can last minutes at a time and and actually, when you're in the game, it feels almost like you've been fighting for almost half an hour when just a couple minutes have gone by. You have this primal sense of fight or flight, and in VR, it just taps into all of that uh, when you're dealing with soldiers around you and also that ammo management as well. There's a wide range of enemies, a lot of them familiar, so you're gonna see head crabs and their different varieties, as well as some new head crabs as well. The animations for these creatures are just so creepy. Uh, not only are they lunging at you and jumping at you, uh, but they're climbing into walls and out of vents and out of toilets even, and the sounds in the game, hearing a head crab jump out at you or crawl around you or knock over a bunch of suitcases as it's scrambling around, it's just terrifying.
There are also plenty of new enemy types designed for the game, some new takes on the headcrabs, on the zombies, on the combine soldiers, and some wholly new enemies uh, that work really well and take advantage of you being trapped essentially in your VR headset. There's this creature that I'll describe as almost like an electric land stingray, which really is tough to beat and every time one would show up I would just curse out loud and brace myself so the next 15 minutes trying to defeat it and run away. It really feels like that classic Half-Life encounter. The weapons in the game can be upgraded and while you're exploring the world looking for ammo, whether it's magazines or power cells, you're also looking for this resource called resin. There are these pucks in the game and you collect enough of them and you find a combine upgrade station and you put your weapon in and you can get things like a a red dot sight or extra ammunition capacity for your weapon or even a laser sight. And the weapon models, I gotta call these out because they're like the Russell gloves, the gravity gloves that you're holding. They're just so detailed. What you see on the models have to make sense. If you're upgrading the bullet capacity of the pistol from 10 to 20 bullets, you see that attachment and you see little indicators for the bullets and the animation when you drop that magazine, pop it back in and reload, all of that is just so wonderfully believable. Now the laser sight upgrade uh, made the game a little bit too easy, I want to say. Um, and if you're playing the game, one recommendation I would have is if you want to get through it quickly, upgrade to the laser, laser sight as fast as you can. But if you want to feel the satisfaction and the challenge of the combat, um, then I would say don't upgrade to the laser sight. Get the ammo capacity, get the auto loader for the shotgun, get the red dot sight so you can spot the weak points or the enemies. Um, it's one of the things that I don't think breaks the game, but for me, definitely the laser sight made it a little bit too easy. Uh, there are tons of physics objects in the world as well, and while you can move your hand through them, I'm using the pistol to open a door or to kind of rummage through a waste bin or a cabinet and, and find the items that you're supposed to find, uh, you're never using those objects for offense. And it's one of the things I wish the game had. Combat is essentially just with projectiles with firearms, you're using the pistol and the shotgun. And not that there's anything I have against ranged combat because it can be pretty challenging when the enemies are coming at you from multiple directions and drones are flying at you and head crabs are crawling toward you. I really want the opportunity to have some melee combat and there is no real melee combat. Yes, you can pick up a chair and swat a head crab aside or can throw a heavy canister at, uh, at a zombie and, and shoot a red canister to blow it up or you're chucking grenades, but there's nothing quite like the gravity gun of Half-Life 2 where I'm picking up a table saw blade and shooting it as a projectile. What I wanted to do was, you know, pick up a broomstick, break it in half and use it as a spear, uh, which would be great if I ran out of ammo. Here, you're really using and relying on the, the weapons that you have. And there aren't even a ton of weapons in this game. Valve made that choice to simplify, to pare that combat option down. Uh, and unlike some other VR games, there's no sense of recoil. Uh, you're not, if you fire and you aim down the sight and you mash the trigger, you're not gonna have your arm swing up. Uh, having two hands on the weapon uh, doesn't really let you stabilize anything in the game. You're, what you're doing is you're stabilizing your hands in the real world. Now, the second hand is also useful in uh, really dark locations because a flashlight turns on, and that's where some of the combat encounters get also really tense, where you have to decide whether you want to steady your hand and have the flashlight aim out in front of you, or when you need to reload or look around the corner, you detach your hand and aim it to illuminate a different part of the game. This is one of those places where it really only works with VR. You're not gonna have that kind of two-handed motion control on a traditional flat screen game.
Finally, we come to the puzzles, and the game also has plenty of puzzles. There are some things that are very discreetly puzzles when you're going to a combine upgrade station or you find these locked cabinets, and they're spatial puzzles. So you use a multi-tool to activate them, and these holograms pop up in the air, and you're using both hands to manipulate them, these procedurally generated puzzles. It's reminiscent of some of the mechanics that Valve explored in the lab. So if you remember that game Zortex, where you're flying a little ship around and you have to dodge objects, that's what those puzzles feel like. You're maneuvering and you're manipulating things in real space. There's also a lot of great near field interactions. So if you're disabling a trip mine, for example, you have to look real close up to the object and kind of keyhole through a series of tunnels. And it reminds me of some of the great puzzle design that we saw, for example, in uh, Cloudhead Games, uh, The Gallery. These spatial puzzles get really difficult over time, and because some of that near-field interaction requires precise movements, not only does it require high dexterity on your hands part to keep your hands steady and be nimble and maneuver around the space, it's also a place where having good tracking matters in your VR system. Now, the other type of puzzle in the world is the world puzzles, also another classic Half-Life trait. You're following pipes, following energy conduits, and with Alex's multi-tool, one of the best type of puzzles is manipulating the wires and the current of power flowing literally behind the walls of the world. You're seeing the veins of the world and being able to kind of see through and physically turn and look around them, uh, it's really satisfying. Some of these puzzles are uh, a little bit difficult. I think Valve isn't afraid to make you think about them. And I met there are times where I was in a room for five to 10 minutes, scratching my head, trying to see, did I do something wrong? Did I encounter a game bug? And no, I just didn't think of the world and the puzzle in a, in a way that was maybe hinted at earlier. And almost every time I was able to get past those puzzles just by thinking enough. And I played through the campaign wearing Valve's Index headset and controllers, but on my second playthrough, I tried a variety of headsets, including the Oculus Rift and the Quest and the HTC Vive Pro, as well as the Cosmos, and they all played fairly well. Uh, Headset-wise, it's gonna all be about ergonomics, uh, not necessarily even field of view, uh, because you're in this game for you know, maybe hours at a time, uh, having a comfortable headset and a comfortable strap really, really mattered. So while you might be playing this on an Oculus Quest, for example, with the link cable, my recommendation is modify it with like the Vive Deluxe Audio head strap so you can actually have it comfortable and wear it for long periods of time. There's also some differences in the controllers. It played really great with the Index controllers and also really well with the Oculus controllers, surprisingly. Um, you don't have that ability to let go of the controllers where you're throwing a grenade, but it has this very satisfying feel with the gravity gloves, um, with looking down the sights, with all the reloading mechanisms work great on the Quest and Rift S controller. Uh, the only thing I would say is I, I wish there was not only a thumbstick, but an addition trackpad as well uh, because that lets you do movement as well as weapon switching uh, which the index has. My favorite headset to play it on was the Valve Index followed by the Vive Pro with the index controllers and then the Rift S and the Quest with the Oculus Link cable. If you have original Vive and it does work with the Vive Wands, I would try to see if you could upgrade to the Valve Index controller first just because the wands were a little cumbersome when you're trying to use the reload mechanic. These tracking markers on top kind of get in the way of each other and the grip button on the side just isn't as satisfying as having the analog grip and feel of like even the Oculus controller. Uh, I was actually surprised that I like playing this more on the Rift S than I did on the Oculus Quest. And I think that's largely due to comfort. The Rift S was more comfortable to wear and it performed a little better and it didn't have uh, compression artifacts that I noticed in the Quest. When you're in rooms with a lot of volumetric fog or particles, uh, all of that compresses when you're playing with a link cable and it just didn't look quite as good. Uh, Valve has updated SteamVR though to improve the tracking on the Quest with a link cable. Uh, so it's still a very viable way to play the game, uh, just not my favorite way. 
Valve has put it in accessibility mode in Alex, so you can play the game with just one hand. And reloading, which normally would require two hands, uh, in this case, you would just put the one pistol over the shoulder, press a button, and it would reload. Makes that process a little simpler, but you're still having to contend with that cognitive load of managing your ammo count, of managing how many bullets are left in the magazine, and so it doesn't make any of the combat encounters that, that much uh, easier or less scary. The puzzles are in fact a little bit more challenging with the one hand when you can't manipulate these holograms with your other, other hand, but the game is fully playable and traversal you have to use blink or teleport. No continuous locomotion with one-handed play. It took me about 12 hours to get through the campaign's 11 levels, and with some of the other reviewers I chatted with, around 15 hours or so. So it's a very full-length, meaty game. Uh, but the range of time and the range of playthrough time is really going to be up to you and how much time you want to spend in that world, how much exploration you want to do, and even how much time you want to spend in the combat. Because you could upgrade to that laser sight, and the combat becomes, I think, pretty easy. Uh, but that second time I played through the game, turned the difficulty up to hard, decided not to opt for the laser sight, just looking down through the barrel, and I actually felt, it felt more rewarding, you know, spending more time in the combat feeling like it's actually, I'm in the heat of the moment, that's what VR brings to it. It's not just about getting through the level, it's about feeling present in the moment of these intense situations. And that takes us to maybe the existential question uh, of Half-Life Alex that so many people out there have been asking since Valve announced the game last year, and that's, does Half-Life Alex did this game have to be a VR game? And I guess technically the answer is no. Valve could put a bunch of resources into porting this over for PC or console, but that would mean abstracting all of the interactions I talked about. You know, whether that's the reloading, uh, that would be pressing a button on your gamepad or a key on your keyboard, or pressing E to open a crate or push a door open as opposed to physically pushing it open and peering around the corner. All of that sense of awe and spectacle of being in the world, the claustrophobia and fear of being in the dark, using your flashlight, and not being able to look away from the screen as traditional games have allowed you to do, that's what makes Half-Life Alex Half-Life Alex. And honestly, that's what makes it so good. It's easily the most polished and full and robust single-player VR game I've played yet, and does meet that high bar of quality and polish that you'd expect from Valve. Virtual reality, track controllers, an immersive headset really is this wonderful gift to game designers and developers and for the Valve team because it's allowing them to really fulfill the ambitions that they had when they made the original Half-Life and all the exploration, combat, and puzzle solving that they pioneered with Half-Life and Half-Life 2. And in turn, Half-Life Alex is this wonderful gift to the VR community and the VR medium and ecosystem because now we have another killer app. It stands alongside games like Beat Saber and Lone Echo and Pavlov as the examples that I love showing to people to say this is what gaming can be. It's not going to replace traditional handheld gaming, console gaming, PC gaming anytime soon, but it gives us this glimpse of what gaming can be, and it's here now. So if you're on the fence, if you don't have a VR headset yet, I implore you, find one, go to a friend's house, try one. You don't have to spend a ton of money if you want to get something like a Windows Mixed Reality headset or a Rift S, and you won't be disappointed because this is a game that really demands to be experienced. If you're still unconvinced or curious as to how the game looks or how some of these VR mechanics work, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I do have another video. It's linked below uh, where I play through the first 
hour of the game. It doesn't dive into any story spoilers. It's essentially still in the tutorial section of the game, but it'll give you a better sense of the visual fidelity and those interactions. So please check that out. But thank you so much for watching. If you're not already in the game already, if you are playing it, let me know what you think of Half-Life Alex, and I'll see you next time. Bye.